Hello, hi, good morning. It's 11, let's start. Hi. Um, yes, welcome. First panel of the day, 11 a.m. on a Sunday. It is uh, titled SNES CD-ROM, The Very Weird History of Gaming's Most Notorious Vaporware. Um, over the next hour, I hope to take you on a magical, fascinating journey uh, through Nintendo's most famous, um, some would say infamous, uh, the canceled p uh, piece of hardware, um, and, and maybe even provide some astonishing revelations that you have never heard before about, about the Super Nintendo CD-ROM project. Um, yeah. Uh, who is who is here and like is like I didn't know there was a Super Nintendo CD-ROM ever in the works at all. Okay, all right. So only a couple of people. Don't worry. I'll try to I'll try to make sure that everybody is brought up to speed. Um, uh, let's let's get this out of the way. Who is this person standing in front of you? Hi, my name is Chris Kohler. I'm currently features editor at a video game website called Kotaku. Um, I'm the author of a couple of books, one of which just came out. It's called Final Fantasy V, um, and it is all about the game Final Fantasy V. Um, it is a nonfiction book, kind of looks at the game's um, uh, development, uh, the culture around it, my own story about it. It was the first game I ever imported, um, and it's published by Boss Fight Books. And um, after this panel is over, I'm running right back to my booth uh, on the main show floor. It's at the Nintendo Age booth. It's by, um, it's by Retro USB and by, um, by the guy who did all the video game box art. I'm kind of hidden in there, so come and say hi afterwards because I've got to like, zip back after the thing is over. Uh, also, another book I wrote is called Power Up. It's about Japanese video games, and I have that over there as well. Um, and that is who I am. And so two years ago-ish, um, this happened. And, and what I mean by this is, um, a guy posted this picture on Reddit. Uh, you may know about this, you may have seen this thing, I'm pretty sure it's in the museum here at Portland Retro Gaming Expo, it's been at most major retro gaming expos. Um, and he said, oh yeah, you know, I've heard you guys talking about this, uh, this whole thing where we're back in the day in the 90s, Nintendo and Sony had gotten together to work on uh, uh, you know, the original version of what was going to be the Sony PlayStation, and it was a Super Nintendo with a CD-ROM drive in it? Well, yeah, my dad has that. He has one. And of course, this being Reddit, everybody was like, no, he doesn't. Your dad doesn't have this. And he was like, yeah, he, he totally does. I mean, I gotta, it's in his attic. I got to go back and get it. And you know, a couple of months later, he's like, yeah, here, here it is. I got it out of his attic. There it is. And there were, I mean, reactions were kind of split because I saw this and I was like, holy cow, that's real. Like, that's it. Like, this guy didn't make this. You know, this was not, this was not something that, that this dude put together as a joke for Reddit. Like, that's the thing. Um, that is the machine where Sony and Nintendo were going to partner to put out a CD-ROM-based Super Nintendo gaming machine back in the early, early 90s. Uh, and then everybody else was like, no, it's, that's fake. That's ridiculous. That's, that's, you're, you're, you're a liar. There's no way you can possibly have this. But he did. He did have it. And, and Terry, Terry Diebold, the guy who, who owns it, is here at the show. And um, in, in short, Terry was not a video game industry person, but he worked for a company um, that was run by the guy who used to be the head of Sony Computer Entertainment America, and that guy had taken this with him when he left Sony, and then he brought it to that company, and then they shut down the company, and he left all of his stuff there, and it was, became abandoned property, and it got auctioned. Um, and Terry ended up, uh, the, the story he tells is he didn't actually end, he, he just wanted to buy a bunch of like um, plates and cups and things like that for like 70 bucks or whatever, and then that was in the box. Um, and he's like, that's cool, I'll put it in my attic. Um, yeah. And, uh, and they had no idea for a very, I mean, they knew it was something, I mean, obviously you see this and you're like, well, that's neat, you know, um, hold on to it. So what is, what, I mean, at first, I mean, so this was the photo that was posted to Reddit. And I mean, already just from this one photo, you can start seeing things that I think are fascinating, such as the fact that Terry owns a knife block, but no knives. <laughs> But beyond that, um, this, what is this? this? This was a prototype. This was never officially manufactured or made or meant to be sold at all. Um, and what it turned out to be, because nobody really knew what the innards of this thing would be, what it turned out to be was pretty much a super 
Nintendo or Super Famicom, the standard Super Famicom doesn't do anything fancy, just runs Super Nintendo games, that has a CD-ROM drive in it. And that's, and that's different from, say, like, the, if you've got a Genesis and a Sega CD, the Sega CD isn't just a CD-ROM drive. It's a CD-ROM drive, but then there's also an additional processor in there. There's more hardware in there that allows you, when you combine all that stuff together, to make games that are bigger, better, can do more things. This is literally just a Super Nintendo that has 700 gigabytes of storage. Or, seven, no, 700 megabytes of storage. <laughs> It's been a long time. I'm thinking it, nobody thinks in megabytes anymore. 700 megabytes of storage. Um, so it can't, it can't do anything more powerful. And the, the deal between Sony and Nintendo to produce this thing would eventually completely fall apart in a spectacular fashion. Um, and and the, the aftermath of the falling apart of this deal would lead to, I mean, as we kind of now know, Sony taking away the lion's share of the video game market from Nintendo. And it would essentially, I mean, this, the fact that this deal fell apart essentially just created the video game industry that we know today. Um, but we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. So let's go back to the year 1988. 1988 was when Sony and Nintendo signed the deal uh, that would allow as it turned out, Sony to produce a Super Nintendo with a CD-ROM drive in it. This is when they signed the deal. This is what video games were like in 1988. Like, this is what was on the shelves. F Mega Man 2 came out at the tail end of 1988. Final Fantasy 2 came out around the same time in the middle. And if you were, if you were like the world's most earliest adopter of the hottest, hottest, best, best new gaming products at the end of 98 when they, when they put this deal together, that you might have bought a Mega Drive at Sega Genesis in Japan, which was released at the end of 1988 with games like Space Harrier 2. This is the highest, highest end of home video games in 1998. And that is really, or it's 1988. You know, thank you, audience. You've now caught me twice on saying weird things. Um, and that, this is, the, this is the world in which, this is what video games were like, and this is the context in which Nintendo signed a deal saying, yeah, I guess you can put a CD-ROM drive in a, in a, in a game system. What are you, you going to do with it? CD-ROM is a very early technology. It wasn't really being used for that much. What are you going to do? Take... 800 copies of Mega Man 2 and put them on a CD? Like, what are you going to do with a CD-ROM drive? And, and quite frankly, nobody really, you know, knew at that point. Um, CD-ROM was a very early technology. It wasn't being used for very much. Here's a piece from InfoWorld Magazine, 86. Um, and, and, and this was released in 1985. This was it. This was the first consumer CD-ROM drive. This was 1985. If you had, an, if you had an, uh, an IBM PC, you could buy a CD-ROM drive. That was it. It is a huge, huge ass thing. Literally, just to read a CD-ROM. No, there's nothing fancy in there. It just, it just reads data off a CD-ROM. Um, and it cost $14.95. Uh, um, that's, that's, that's roughly $3,500 today. Um, it came with, and by the way, this was made by a company called Philips, um, which, uh, which is going to enter back into our, our story later. This, is, this was the first CD-ROM drive you get for PCs, and it came with Grolier's Academic American Encyclopedia. And it was, it was one of the first, uh, that was one of the first commercial CD-ROM titles. It was text-based. There was no graphics. It was literally a CD-ROM drive with an encyclopedia on it that was just text. And that was about the limits of the imagination that people had in like 1985, like what you could really do with a, with a CD-ROM. Um, here's, just to give you an idea, because I couldn't actually find any screenshots, here's, here's a picture um, of uh, an encyclopedia software running on an Atari ST computer. And this probably looked a lot better than that IBM version did, because this actually kind of has rudimentary graphics. Um, this is what people were doing originally with CD-ROMs. It was just like, you have tons of data. Well, what are we going to put on this thing? Okay, an encyclopedia. Sounds good. Um, and so a phone directory. You can put your whole, the whole phone book for the whole country on a CD-ROM, which now sounds terrifying. Um, <laughs> but as 1988 was, was coming to a close, 
probably after Nintendo and Sony signed the deal. We don't know the date, we know the year, um, but unless it was you know, in the very, very ending days of, of, of 1988, then this came out after that deal was signed. This is the PC Engine CD-ROM. That's the PC Engine on the, on the right-hand side. It came out in 87, that's the TurboGrafx-16. That's CD-ROM attachment. This, the, the, the Turbo Graphics was an upgrade over like the, the Famicom or the NES. Um, uh, and, and, and now um, you could, it has 16-bit graphics and then in 1988 you could purchase the CD-ROM 2 the, or the CD-ROM-ROM as you were supposed to pronounce it. Um, and that's true. And uh, it cost about $600. And the weird, oh, and, and Getting, getting a little off track, the weirdness of it, if you know this, um, it comes in like three, it comes in two pieces. There's the CD-ROM drive and that interface unit. There was something about like, they, they really tried so hard to keep the price down on this thing. That's why they split it into parts because they actually sold them separately. And because Japan taxed um, CD, they, they taxed computers but not CD players, or they taxed CD players but not computers, so they literally split them apart into two different things. One of them had a sales tax applied to it, the other one didn't, and that's why they did that. Like, literally, just to, to get it down to the, the cheapest they possibly could in 1988, this was like the first, like, mass market CD-ROM, uh, you know, certainly first CD-ROM gaming platform, but really one of the first mass market CD-ROM devices ever. Um, and it was very much like uh, the so-called Nintendo PlayStation in that it was pretty much just adding data storage to the pre-existing TurboGrafx hardware. It didn't really, it didn't upgrade it very much, if at all. So what was it used for? Um, there were two launch titles at first. Yep. Fighting Street and Noriko. And at first, these would have, seem to have nothing to do with each other. One of them is the first Street Fighter, which for reasons I still don't understand got a name change when it came to Turbo Graphics. They called it Fighting Street, but it's just Street Fighter 1. Um, the other one is a dating game where you date a uh, popular, at the time, idol. Um, and the, the connection between the two of them, I only sort of like realized recently, was that they both had a whole lot of voice samples. And that, I think, was the driving force behind these first two launch titles. And that was the initial thing that people thought, oh, that's what we can do with CD-ROM. We can take a game that ordinarily would fit onto a cartridge, but we can add a buttload of audio. We can add real audio. We can have voice samples. So, fighting, so Street Fighter 1, I don't know if you remember, but like when you, know, when you lose a match or you win a match, um, they actually, the, the, the defeated fighter talks to you. They all use the same voice samples and stuff like that. And so there's like full sentences in there. And this has this girl's songs and things like that. Um, these are the first two CD-ROM games ever, by the way. There were no PC CD-ROM games uh, before these two. Like, these, these came out on December, whatever it was, December 4, 1988. Two first CD-ROM games in the world. Um, the Manhole, the Manhole by, by Cyan Worlds, which would later do Myst, um, came out um, in 89, so close after this. And that version is super rare today because, again, who would buy that? Like, you, nobody had an 1989 like, CD-ROM drive for their PC. They made it for those very early adopters, but there just were very few of them. Okay, so that's, that's setting the stage for this whole thing. So, the Sony Nintendo CD-ROM deal of 1988. Um, here is a very important person in this whole story. It's Ken Kutaragi. Um, at the time, he was an engineer for Sony. Uh, he built, uh, the, he, he, had, he had struck a deal with Nintendo, like, secretly, um, to make the sound chip that was in the Super Famicom system. Um, apparently you could do a lot, like, secretly at Sony in those days. It was so big, um, management didn't want to do it, but he was kind of a maverick, so he just went ahead and, and did it. And it was a big success. I mean, the Super Famicom, Super Nintendo has amazing sound. Um, and he wanted, he wanted more. He, he had the vision that CDs were like the medium of the future for storing video games. Um, and he wanted to partner with Nintendo to do basically what would have been the TurboGrafx CD of the Super NES and just sort of throw a CD-ROM drive attachment on there. And they, they did sign this, this deal, and they signed this deal um, to, to put the CD-ROM drive in the Super Famicom and have Sony manufacture that. And the, the interesting part about this deal, um, which would cause all the trouble later, it wasn't so much that they were making this thing, but it was that Sony, as part of this deal, 
had, had scored the rights free and clear to make um, CD-ROM software by, it, by itself. It could make whatever CD-ROM software it wanted. This was an issue because Nintendo made the, the bulk of its money at the time through licensing. If you wanted to make a game for the Famicom, the NES, the Super Famicom, Super NES, whatever, you had to go through Nintendo. You had to pay them not only a, a, you know, a fee, a licensing fee, but they got a cut of everything you ever sold. If you sold a million copies, they got a cut of each one of those. Um, in the US, Nintendo took it a step further with the Famicom and Nintendo started actually manufacturing all of the games. So not only are they getting a cut you know, of, the, of the sales, but they're the only people that with the Famicom, the, the publishers kind of made, manufactured their own games, but on the NES, Nintendo manufactured everything. So you had to pay Nintendo to make the game. They didn't even let you make your own game. So it is like incredibly confusing that Nintendo would sign a deal with Sony that says to Sony, yeah, you can, you can make your own CDs, it's fine, whatever, just make anything you want, which apparently that was the parameters of the deal. And so then the question becomes, why would Nintendo do that? Like, why would they give that up? Why would they not say to Sony instead, no, we control all of that, and we get a cut of all the games you make, and you have to go through us? A, I think that, that Nintendo did not imagine what CD-ROM could do. Like, I don't think that they imagined that Sony would be able to, you know, make games that really, you know, were superior using CD-ROM technology. But additionally, beyond that, because again, I mean, we, we looked at, at what games were like in 1988. You know, what, why would you need to put that on a CD-ROM? There's another reason, though. And it, and it stems from... Uh, there was a 2016 interview with this guy. His name is Shigeo Maruyama. And he was uh, the former chairman of Sony Computer Entertainment, um, which is you know, where the, the, the division of Sony, which is now pretty much gone, like they've reorganized since then, but that was the original division that was working on video games. And in a 2016 interview, he said outright, it's a Japanese game site called um, Den Faminiko Gamer, uh, and this was translated by a site called Nintendo Everything. Just want to make sure. And this guy was Kudaragi's boss, by the way, as the chairman of Sony Computer Entertainment. He says, we explicitly told them, them being Nintendo, that we were going to focus on everything but video games. So his recollection, 25 years later, was that the, the idea seems to be that this was not going to be Sony making video games and putting them on a CD-ROM, but that this was going to be like Nintendo made the video games on the cartridges, and then Sony would sell this PlayStation thing, which would run Super Nintendo games, but then the CD-ROM drive would be used for, like, Grolier's Multimedia Encyclopedia, you know, like, stuff like that. Like, that... In the words of this, the former chairman of Sony Computer Entertainment, he is saying that they told Nintendo, we're not going to make games. We are going to do movies, music. And that was what Sony was at the, at the time. Um, you know, so Nintendo, Nintendo had worked with other Japanese companies to do stuff like the Famicom Titler. This came out in 1989 by Sharp. And this was, it was a Famicom, but it, uh, an NES, right? But it also had software and hardware built in to let you add subtitles to videos. Um, so if you wanted to take a home video and add text to it, or if you wanted to like um, subtitle um, and, and make fan subs of an anime or something like that, which I think a lot of people did with this thing, right? So Nintendo had no problem with people just taking its hardware and putting it in to a sort of an all-in-one system that had an extra, you know, functionality that wasn't video game related. Um, Sharp, by the way, also did those NES TVs that are very prized by collectors now, a CRT TV with an NES built in. Um, or, more, more to the point, um, this was shown off, this is a still from a YouTube video, I had to go look this up, called the Bandai HET, company Bandai, now Bandai Namco, called the Home Entertainment Terminal. And what is this? This is a Super Nintendo that is sort of has an extra sort of computery, it's a Super Famicom laptop with a built-in screen, and they sold this as, you can hook this up to a CD-ROM drive. 
So even in 1993, after the Nintendo-Sony deal had fallen apart, Nintendo was already licensing, this never came out by the way, this was shown off but did not ship, was already was licensing to Bandai the rights to make a combo Super Nintendo in a laptop form that could connect to a CD-ROM drive. So, and, it, and in this case, you better believe, I don't know this for sure because we know very little about this, but I bet you that the contract specified that Bondi was not allowed to put any games, you know, on this thing. Um, Nintendo's viewpoint was likely that this was what was going, to, what, what Sony was going to do for that Sony PlayStation, that Nintendo would make the games and Sony would do this. Um, but, and, and, and it, it was right for them to think this, because, so, in 1987, so prior to, prior to 1987, you sort of see the history of what's going to happen here, prior to 87, Sony made Japanese electronics. They did not do content. So they, did, they made electronics. Um, but in 1987, Sony had just signed the deal to acquire CBS Records in America. This was, this, this, by, this was the, you remember the late 80s, maybe some of you do. Um, this, was, this was when, you know, Michael Crichton's novel, Rising Sun, and everybody is freaked out about, oh my God, the Japanese are buying America. You know, like they're coming in and they're buying, you know, they bought CBS Records. That CBS Records was Michael Jackson's record label. The Japanese are coming in with all their money that they're making in the, the bubble economy and they're buying up all these American institutions. They're going to buy baseball and turn it into sumo. People were really upset. Um, and this was part of that. And, and Sony was one of the companies gobbling stuff up at the time. And so 87, they buy CBS. Oh, now Sony makes electronics and they also have a major record label. 1989, they buy Columbia Pictures. And now Sony makes electronics, but they also make, they have a major record label, they have a major movie studio. And then in 1989, Sony founds Sony ImageSoft, and Sony starts making video games. Um, so very quickly, in a span of two years, Sony goes from, we do not make content, to we make all of the content. Um, and so then, so you can imagine Nintendo saying, uh-oh, uh, we didn't think they were going to be making like actual stuff for this thing. Um, so, and they, they, put, they put out, um, uh, so Sony ImageSoft started out as a Nintendo third party. They made Super Dodgeball for NES, uh, they put out Solstice for NES, um, and they were for a while just doing just Nintendo stuff because that was who they were partnered with. Um, so, very quickly after this, the Super Famicom comes out at the end of 1990. Um, it, the Super Famicom did not have many games uh, starting out, interestingly enough. I, I counted um, only 40 games in its first year being on the market. Like when the Super Nintendo came out, it was a year later, then we had, oh, Final Fantasy II and Final Fight and Gradius and Mario World and F-Zero Pilot Wings. Um, a lot of that was because Japan had had a year of, of head start to put out games that could all be sort of pushed out in 91. But in its first year, it only had 40 games, which is just a couple a month. Um, and it's probably good that they waited to come out in the U.S. because they really needed a strong launch to combat the Sega Genesis, which, you know, Sega had been this tiny little competitor nipping at Nintendo's heels, but by the time that we got to 1991, Sega was a formidable competitor in the United States. Um, in, in Japan, it was actually the, the PC Engine that put up the biggest fight to the Super Famicom. So, a year later, or not a year later, June 1991, this is from Nintendo Power Magazine's June 1991 issue. This is the issue in which they formally introduced the Super Nintendo to the American audience. This is where they first showed off the, the look of the system. Um, and you will note, and this is, okay, so just to, just to set the stage here. This was the June issue. This would have gotten subscribers in the middle of May, the way that magazines worked in that, at that time. So it was actually a couple of weeks ahead of the upcoming Summer Consumer Electronics Show, which is where Nintendo was going to debut the SNES and let retailers and the press play the US version for the first time. 
E3 was not for another four years. It was started in 1995. So the CES is where all that happened. Um, the article ran down some basics about how, you know, Nintendo had, Nintendo of America had taken the Super Famicom design and worked on it and changed it around and made it super ugly. And um, the, then, then also, this here, first our ever article about the Super Nintendo, it mentioned, we are making a CD-ROM unit with Sony. So literally at the, at the, the, the beginning of the introduction of the Super Nintendo to American audiences, they were like, and by the way, CD-ROM is coming. Hmm. So, we move on to the 1991 summer CES, where all everything, all the stuff goes down. Nintendo is now poised to unveil the Super Nintendo to the United States, and Sony, it, at its own press conference, is also poised to announce um, that it is working alongside Nintendo on the CD project. So, again, there's, there's sort of a mythology about this where, oh, at the summer CES, Sony stood up on stage and announced to the world that it was working on the CD system with Nintendo. It's like, well, no, because it had already been in Nintendo power. So it's not as if it was a big surprise when they unveiled it on stage that day. Um, the, the event has kind of become mythologized in that way. You hear a lot of things about how the Nintendo Sony deal went down and how it fell apart. Um, and a lot of it doesn't stand up to scrutiny when you start actually looking at the timeline of what happened. Um, so here's how the timeline usually goes. June 1st, 1991, Sony unveils the PlayStation, that's, there's, notice there's a space between those two words at that time, at the CES conference. Partnership with Nintendo seems great. Everybody is all on board, everything is great. June 2nd, 1991, Nintendo unveils its partnership with Philips to develop the SNES CD-ROM, killing the deal with Sony live on stage at CES and shocking an audience full of people. Um, fact is, that's not quite how it went down, um, although this is typically what you hear. So, Seattle Times newspaper, May 31st, 1991. Nintendo comma Philips join in games on CD. Nintendo has agreed with Philips to put its popular video games on compact discs. That's a Nintendo spokesperson saying that directly to the Seattle Times newspaper on May 31st, 1991, a day before Sony's conference in which they unveiled the PlayStation. Hi. Thanks for calling in. Um, so that's interesting. You don't really hear about that very often. In fact, so if you look back at David Sheff's book, Game Over, this came out in 1993. There's a lot of inaccuracies in this book, but in, in this case, I mean, I think this is pretty solid. Um, you see that Sony executives in Japan learned that Nintendo were going to announce this at their press conference, that they were going to go with the company Philips instead of Sony to do the SNES CD-ROM add-on. Um, but they learned about it 48 hours prior, and we're, we're stunned, as said in the book. Um, and then Howard Lincoln, who was an executive at Nintendo, said there were tremendous efforts on a worldwide basis to keep that press conference from happening. Um, so there is this sort of a, you know, idea that literally, like, Sony executives were sitting in the audience during Nintendo's press conference and expected Nintendo to say the word Sony, you know, but instead Nintendo said the word Philips and they were shocked like at that moment in the audience. But it's not true. They, they, they had a heads up that that was gonna happen. Um, so, something else. So now, so now note that Sony knew that Nintendo was not gonna work with Sony on the, on the, on the add-on for the SNES that would add a CD-ROM drive to it. Um, but Sony went ahead with its press conference anyway, making a big show of the fact that it, it had this deal, which was still very much, you know, the contract was signed with Nintendo um, to produce the system that we, that we get to see here at the show, that Nintendo PlayStation so-called thing with the Super NES and the all-in-one unit, right? So Sony puts on its press conference, and what does the, what does the coverage look like? New York Times says, Sony, Nintendo's partner, will be a rival too. 
This was before Nintendo's press conference in which they talked about Philips. So what did this actually say? Larry Propes, who was the head of Electronic Arts at that time, or one of the major executives of Electronic Arts at that time, was like, yeah, well, you know, Sony, oh, no, I'm sorry, that was not Larry Probst. This, 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 sorry, this, this first quote is simply, this is, the, this is the article, this is the straight news article that was reported. It's not somebody's opinion article, this is a news story. And the news story in the New York Times said, Sony will clearly become a competitor of Nintendo because, it conf because they collaborated on the machine, but it confirmed that it retained the licensing rights to the, to the compact disc game developed for the, for the new system. And so people from the New York Times looked at this and they were like, you know, they're, they're going to be uh, a competitor of Nintendo. I'm going to rush through a little bit here because I'm, I'm seeing I have about 15 minutes left. Um, so EA, Larry Probst at EA is like, Sony got a big business advantage. Um, and then it says the timing of Sony's press conference was curious because it followed news reports, which we saw earlier, that Philips and Nintendo were collaborating on a compact disc-based game machine. So when Sony did its press conference, it was not thinking that they were Nintendo's one and only partner. They knew that the Nintendo deal, that Nintendo was going to go with a different company for this, the SNES add-on, um, and that Nintendo was not going to have Sony make the add-on system, and that they knew that. And so when they were doing their press conference, they were fully cognizant of that. And people coming out of it were coming out of that press conference going, so are they like trying to like compete with Nintendo in terms of making games? So here's really what went down, right? That you know, May 31st, Nintendo tells the media it's gonna partner with Philips. Sony tries to stop the conference. It can't, they do their conference anyway. And when Nintendo announced the Philips deal on June 2nd, it wasn't a huge surprise because anybody who read the newspaper knew that they were gonna do it. Um, I'll leave it with Shigeo Maruyama. It's easy. I'm not, I'm not saying that Nintendo was, was, this is me talking, I'm not saying that Nintendo was totally 100% on board or, you know, or above board with this deal, but there's this idea that Sony was this, you know, were, were, were totally forthright in every respect and Nintendo, you know, stabbed them in the back. But they were both stabbing each other in the back is what happened. I get the feeling, he said, that something was going on behind the scenes because the, Sony never filed a lawsuit against Nintendo. This is, again, the head of Sony Computer Entertainment at that time. Why didn't they file a lawsuit against Nintendo for breaking the contract? There had to be a reason Sony wasn't able to go after him. And this, this interview only happened in 2016, and it was a very interesting, you know, new perspective on things. Um, so in 1991, the Super Nintendo was released. Also, Philips also released the CDI, which was its own gaming, CD-ROM-based gaming platform. Um, and the idea was that people, they were kind of saying like, oh yeah, well, you know, Nintendo has this deal with Philips. Philips is going to make the CD-ROM drive for the Super Nintendo and CDI games will be compatible with that. Like they were kind of talking about that. Um, but it was all very vague and up in the air. So, Nintendo, April 1992, Super NES, they have a whole big spread in uh, Nintendo Power Magazine saying that CD-ROM is, quote, just around the corner. Super NES CD-ROM is totally happening, you guys. Um, it's going to be released in January of 1993 for the low, low price of $200. Um, the games that they mentioned in this thing, you can see uh, actually Cosmic Osmo down in the lower left-hand corner. That was a, they were literally just like trying to get as much CD-ROM content as they could on this thing, and that was a game that was made by Cyan Worlds, who, would, who were very shortly going to go on to make Myst. Um, and they also talk about the seventh guest uh, in this article a lot. In fact, they, they referred to it in the article as guest. They just called it guest. And they were talking about how great it was going to be. Um, hey, you guys ever notice that, um, you know, a lot of the early CD-ROM games like Sewer Shark and, you know, Night Trap or Night Trap but, you know, came out on the 3DO and, like, you know, a lot of those games, like, they come out on a lot of the CD-ROM-based video game systems. Um, you ever notice how Seventh Guest only ever came out on PC and the CDI? Yeah, that's because Nintendo actually locked down the exclusive console rights to the Seventh Guest for the SNES CD-ROM and then did not use them. Um, and that's why it appeared only on the CDI, because the CDI was sort of part of the Nintendo deal at that time, so they were able to put it on that. But like. But for the fact that Nintendo paid a 
buttload of money for something they never used, um, you know, this probably would have appeared on the 3DO and the PlayStation or whatever, but it's not, it only appeared on the CDI. Here's another myth. You, you hear a lot that uh, Secret of Mana, the Squaresoft role-playing game for the, for the SNES, was originally going to be a CD-ROM game, and people say, oh yeah, it was going to run on that Nintendo PlayStation thing. Totally, definitely not true. Because, remember, okay, so June 2nd was when that deal got killed. Um, June 28th, uh, the, the, the game that came before Secret of Mana, Secret of Mana is in the Seiken Densetsu series, it's called Seiken Densetsu 2 in Japan, June 28, 1991, that's when Seiken Densetsu 1 was, was released in Japan, and it was the same development team. So they didn't even start Secret of Mana uh, until after the Nintendo and Sony deal was dead. So Secret of Mana was going to be a CD-ROM game, but it was going to be for the add-on that Philips was making for the SNES. It was never going to run. So if we ever do find a CD copy of you know, Secret of Mana, like, you know, from the middle of development or whatever, when it was still a CD-ROM game, it would not run on that Nintendo PlayStation. Um, but, it's, but it's interesting because the timing totally does not work. Now, what's, what's also interesting is that Secret of Mana was released on August 6, 1993. That's, note that that's more than two years of development time. That's about twice as long as most Super NES games took to make. So that actually very much supports the argument that this game ran into serious development hell. Because, again, like, Final Fantasy V was made in a year. Final Fantasy VI was made, I think, in about a year and a half. Like, the fact that this game took two years is indicative of, like, something bad went down. And, in, and indeed, it really does seem like it, they, they had to cancel the CD-ROM version of it and then move what they had done to a cartridge. Um... I'm rushing a little bit because I have too much stuff in here. Um, this, I mean, here's, here's a, again, a, another mention. So this is the Ogopogo Examiner. This was a newsletter that Squaresoft uh, sent out to its customers. If they had your address, they'd send you this, like, one-page newsletter letting you know what was going on with Square. Super hard to find these. I, I own <coughs> one of the issues, and I can't even find scans online for a lot of these. But in, in this one... Uh, in spring 1992, they talk about summer 1993, the CD-ROM drive is coming out, and third-party licensees like Square are beginning to design the software. Um, but this, again, you know, the, the, the timing does not work out. So, um, in 1992, Sony had to figure out what they were going to do. Um, and they had a big board meeting, and they were like, well, Nintendo backed out of this deal. What are we going to do? We should just not do video games. But Ken Kutaragi <laughs> convinced Sony's president, that's Norio Oga right there, to move forward with the PlayStation as a solo project, to, to just, let's just make our own video game system. And really the way that he, that he did it was, was to say, are we gonna let Nintendo, you know, publicly humiliate us like this? Like we, we should fight back and, and we should just do video games and we should try to take on Nintendo. We're gonna take that lying down. Um, so, remember what I said about, like, Sony being a really big company at the time and all kinds of stuff going on and you can do things in secret, but not everybody was necessarily on board with what you were doing? A couple of months later, this happens. And you don't hear about this very much, do you? October 14th, 1992. Sony gets back on board with the Super NES CD-ROM project. Hmm. The agreement, New York Times writes, allows Nintendo and Sony to license other companies to develop and manufacture and sell disk software with all licensing activity going through Nintendo. The book, there's a book called Console Wars, written by Blake Harris. Um, this describes this uh, event as an action of Sony's old guard. This is the old guard at Sony. Because, because look, the smart thing to do um, for Sony at that time, the obvious thing for Sony to do, the safe thing for Sony to do, was to get on board with Nintendo again, to, to, to put the past aside and work with Nintendo, because Nintendo was the 800-pound gorilla of, of Japanese video gaming. So why not, how about everybody will just work together? And this was Sony and Philips and Nintendo were all going to collaborate on the Super Nintendo CD-ROM. The risky move, the, the, the sort of ridiculous move, was the idea that Kudaragi was pushing, 
which is let's make our own video game platform. Well, that's that's ridiculous, buddy. Why would you want to do that? That's 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 investing a huge amount of money for what something that would be a failure. You're going to go up against Nintendo and video games. Um, and, and the CDI was still involved in this somehow. Everybody was kind of like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. And it is something that's involved. Um, here we go. February 1993, Nintendo's last stand. Yes. Um, this was a developer conference. This was held in February of 1993. And this is from where we get the information that we have currently about what that Super NES CD-ROM add-on was really going to be like. Um, I'll rush through a little bit of this. Um, the, the, interesting, the interesting part about them, and it kind of talks about like, oh, there's going to be an extra processor because really there was going to be a 32-bit processor in this thing because with people expected that buying a CD-ROM drive meant that your games were going to look better. That's what consumers expected. So they actually needed to put that hardware into the CD-ROM add-on to like, they wanted the games to be appreciably different from the games that they already had. Really interesting thing about this, um, this document that somebody brought home from this you know, uh, developer conference that they had was he pointed out that the custom end disk for the Super NES CD-ROM system, that the disk was going to be in a CD-ROM caddy, like one of these things. <laughs> um, who remembers CD-ROM caddies? Going to the... I remember just at the public school like library, they had you know the first CD-ROM machine they had there. CD-ROMs were in caddies. They were in they were in plastic enclosures to protect the what at the time was a valuable CD-ROM. Um, and Nintendo, the Super NES CD-ROM, had Nintendo actually gone forward and released this thing, the Super NES CD-ROMs would have been like that. They all would have been sold in caddies. And the caddies would have been, the CD-ROM would have been sealed inside the caddy. Why? Because Nintendo was going to put its security chip in the caddy. So that you would not be able, because Nintendo was concerned that people were going to pirate the games and just copy the CD-ROMs. So the copy protection on this, because remember, Sega CD, no copy protection. Right? Turbo graphics, just burn whatever you want, you just play it. The copy protection was nobody has a CDR. <laughs> like, that was the copy protection. Um, but by this time, they were like, mm, um, so, they, so Nintendo was going to be Nintendo, and we're going to make a CD ROM drive, and we're going to, like, totally negate a lot of the advantages of the cheapness of making CDs by literally putting each one of them into a custom plastic caddy with a security chip and then you had to have that security chip where you couldn't run the game. Um, it might have been, a, maybe, you know, maybe it was a good thing after all that Nintendo killed this project. So, then nothing, 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 nothing for a year, and then um, in, in early 1994, Nintendo was like, yeah, um, we're not gonna make CD-ROMs. Not only are we not gonna make CD-ROMs on the, on the SNES, we're not, we're not gonna mess with CD-ROMs, period. And basically, this was both, this was two things. This article, this, this announcement from Nintendo in February 94 represented two things. One, we're not making the, the SNES CD-ROM. And two, we're making a new system called Project Reality, and it will use cartridges. And that was the Nintendo 64. Nintendo never, Nintendo never made a product that used CD-ROMs. Never happened. Um, they, they jumped immediately to the custom discs for the GameCube and then to the... Uh, it's still custom kind of things for Wii and, and, and Wii U. Um, they never made a product that used the CD-ROM. And there was just no evidence left that this, that this project, that this thing that they were going to do, that they promised, this thing that they said when they launched the Super Nintendo, we're going to do this. And then they said it again, we're going to do this. And then they said it's just around the corner. And then it said it's really going to happen this time. And then it's just nothing. The only evidence, <laughs> the only evidence left <laughs> is the fact that to partner up with Philips, part of the, the carrot that Nintendo had to offer to Philips to do this deal was that Philips would get to make... And again, it's like Nintendo was worried that Sony was going to make games for <laughs> Nintendo platforms, and instead it, it lets Philips use Nintendo characters to make truly the, the, the trilogy of the worst Legend of Zelda games uh, ever, ever, ever made. Um, and Hotel Mario, which was like, which seems like a work of genius just because it's, because it's not a terrible game. Um, 
And, uh, and this is it. Here is the legacy. Here is the physical legacy, plus that one Nintendo PlayStation machine of Nintendo's ill-fated, ill-considered um, foray uh, into the idea that they were going to make uh, CD-ROM video games. Thank you very much.